Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 2, making our way on Wednesday nights, verse by verse, through the Old Testament. In the latter half of 1 Chronicles, we looked at David, and David had a singular focus. And that focus was the temple of God. He had a desire to build God a temple. He wasn't comfortable with the idea that he lived in a house of cedar, and the ark rested underneath a tent. And the man of God, the prophet, told him, do whatever's on your heart, for God is with you. And that night, God spoke and said, David will not build me a house. And then God promised that I will build him a house. And revealed that his son Solomon would be the one who would build a temple in Jerusalem. And David began at that time to prepare, to do everything he could to support and to stockpile, to press back the enemy so that Solomon could be successful in building God's house. In our last study, Solomon was given the opportunity to ask God for whatever he wanted. And he asked God for wisdom and understanding so he would know how to come in and out among the people. He would know how to fulfill what God had called him to do. And now, in chapter 2, Solomon is about to begin the building. But if you're going to start a work, you need workers. That's foreign to our culture today. <laughs> that's, that's a word people don't like to hear. Work. Many in the Christian community think that work is, is something that God brought in on the scene after the fall. But in reality, that's not true. If they'll study the Bible, they'll realize that the first thing God did after creating Adam and putting him in the garden, he gave him a job. And through that work, he was to glorify God. And so in this chapter, we're going to look at the chapter and then we're going to, with God's help, bring it home to us and how this applies to us. The title of our study is Looking for Laborers. Looking for Laborers. Many would make the mistake in thinking that the greatest accomplishment, the thing that we should remember about Solomon, was the fact that he was this great man of wisdom. And I would have to say that's not the case. Because five sixths of all the scripture pertaining in this book about Solomon have to do with the building of the temple. Although God does grant wisdom for those who ask, He shines a spotlight on His house. And how many of you would agree with me that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore? Therefore, tonight, His focus is still on his house. It's still on his house. And so King Solomon is looking for laborers. Let's jump right in. Verse 1, And Solomon determined to build an house for the name of the Lord and an house for his kingdom. And Solomon told out threescore and ten thousand men to bear burdens and fourscore thousand to hew in the mountain, and three thousand and six hundred to oversee them. We'll come back to that. And Solomon sent Huram, or Hiram, the king of Tyre, saying... So the first thing we see in this chapter is the request. Solomon is sending a request to this other king, the king of Tyre. He says, As thou d didst dealt with David my father, and didst send him cedars to build him an house to dwell therein, even so deal with me. David had established this connection, this relationship with the king of Tyre, and Solomon wants to capitalize on that. He says, Behold, I build an house 
to the name of the Lord my God. This is the second time we've read this phrase. An house to the name of the Lord my God. If the church is brother so-and-so's, we have trouble. If it's his church, their church, my church, watch out. Watch out. He says, Behold, I build a house to the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to Him, to His name and for Him, Solomon is saying. And he says, And to burn before Him sweet incense, which is a picture of prayer, and for the continual showbread, which pictures fellowship, and for the burnt offerings, morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, and on the new moons, and on the solemn feasts of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. Solomon says, I want to build this house because in it, I want daily incense to be burning. Daily. He says, daily, there's going to be a burnt offering every morning, every evening. God's business is a daily business. Not just Sunday and Wednesday. Not only is God's business a daily business, it's a weekly business. Solomon said every Sabbath. We want to recognize every Sabbath. Not only is it a daily business and a weekly business, it's a monthly business. He says, and the new moons as part of that. And not only is it a daily business, a weekly business, a monthly business, it's a yearly business. He says the feasts that come about throughout the year. And not only is it a daily business, a weekly business, a monthly business, a yearly business, he says an ordinance forever. What we do in other places may be temporal, but what happens here is eternal. It doesn't have an end. And it is my earnest prayer that God would once again awaken His church to that reality. Because far too many Christian people think that church is a place we go to twice a week. Well, let me just say, if you're coming twice a week, you're in the minority. Some churches don't even have a midweek service anymore. And I, and I don't blame the church per se because most likely they kept having it until nobody showed up but the pastor, the, the piano player, and, and maybe their family, you know. It's, it's an option today. God's business, God's kingdom, church things, it's an option. And as we've been making our way through Mark's gospel, since I'm already on a soapbox, I might as well take advantage of it, right? The mentality within the church is serve us instead of service. I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> he says, and the house which I build is great. It's great. And here's why it's great, he says. For great is our God above all gods. He says, I want to build a great house because our God is great. I don't believe it's a stretch to say, you can, I'm just going to say it, you can tell how great a Christian's God is in their thoughts by how great they think God's business is. Solomon says, I'm going to build a great house because God is great and He's not just great, He's above all other gods. If we believe that God is who He says He is, if we believe that the church is what He says it is, then it should be the single most greatest priority in our lives. But it's an option. It's an option quite often. <clears throat> Verse 6. 
And after saying this, Solomon says, but who is able? Who is able to build him a house? Seeing the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain him. He says, yes, this house is going to be great because God is great. And he says, he's so great that I recognize that when we get through building this place, it's not going to contain God. But it is going to be a place where he desires to meet with us. And God has chosen to do his work at a central place. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet you there. And then he says, not only who is able, verse 6, who am I? Who am I then that I should build him a house, save only to burn sacrifice before him? And then he says this, send me now, therefore a man cunning to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in iron and in purple and in crimson and blue that can skill to grave with the cunning men that were with me in Judah and in Jerusalem whom David my father did provide. Solomon says, send me your best. Send me your best. We think of big companies, we think of the military, we think of CEOs, we think of all of these things, and we, we, we think about how they, they strive for excellence. They strive to achieve and, and to accomplish their vision and those type of things. And God has laid out a vision for His people. And oftentimes we fail to think that He deserves the best. And he deserves our best. I don't know what God's called you to. I know what he's called me to. And he desires me to be the best at that that I can be. As a matter of fact, Paul writes to Timothy, a young pastor, and he says, be instant, in season, and out of season. He says, young man, be at your best at all times, even on your worst day. Give him your best. He says, send me your best. When the tabernacle was built, God raised up Bezalel, a skilled man. Proverbs says, see a man skilled in his work? He shall stand before kings. You know, we're consumers in America, so we don't, we don't think about skill anymore. But God is interested in skill. God is interested in details. God is interested in His children being their best for Him. Not being better than one another. See, we got too much of that in the church already. God hasn't called me. I, I had the privilege of listening in on uh, the women's first Bible study. I was in my office and I was studying, but every now and then, you know, I was eavesdropping. And one of the things that they discussed was the fact that, that Eve was one of a kind. And the fact that all of us are one of a kind. The psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. No one else has my fingerprint. I'm, I'm unique. I'm distinct. And if I spend my whole life trying to be someone else, then I'm going to fail at being what God made me to be. And he's asked us to be faithful, to be stewards with what he's placed within us. And here Solomon, the king, is saying, send me your best. We'll come back to that. He said, send me also cedar trees, fir trees, and algum trees. These were rare and they were durable. They were lasting woods. He says, out of Lebanon. And the reason for this is 
because the temple was to be solid, it was to be permanent, it was to last, it was to be durable, it was to be quality. He says, for I know that thy servants can skill to cut timber in Lebanon, and behold, my servants shall be with thy servants. We're all going to work in this together, he says, even to prepare me timber in abundance. For the house which I am about to build shall be wonderful, great. And behold, I will give to thy servants the hewers that cut timber, 20,000 measures of beaten wheat and 20,000 measures of barley, and 20,000 baths of wine and 20,000 baths of oil. We'll come back to that. Verse 11, we've had the request, now the reply. King Hiram replies, and he says, because the Lord hath loved his people, because the Lord hath loved his people, he hath made thee king over them. This is a Gentile king recognizing recognizing in this talk about God's house, in the thoughts of building God's house, he recognizes this is because of God's love. And no matter what people think about God's house today, it's still because of his love. It's because of his love. It's because he loves us. He has left his house at work here. A lot of Christian people have given up on the church. They, they've been hurt or they've been let down or they've been disappointed or, or whatever and now they, I don't know, they, they stay home or, or, or whatever. Maybe they don't do anything but that's a shame. And that's exactly what the enemy wants them to do. We'll come back to that. We're going to come back to a lot of stuff, yeah. <laughs> Verse 12, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel that made heaven and earth. This is a Gentile king. Because of God's house, because of his relationship with David, he's recognizing that God is God and God is creator. And let me tell you tonight, if the Gentiles, if the unbelievers, if the sinners are ever going to come to the reality that God is who he says he is and he's the creator, it's going to be coming from his house. And the church has listened to, I don't know who, tell them to, shh. Just let people decide for themselves. Chapter and verse. Well, we don't want to rock the boat and we don't want people to get upset at us. Chapter and verse. He said, blessed be the God of Israel who made heaven and earth, who hath given to David the king, the king a wise son, endued with prudence and understanding that might build an house. You see the theme here? House, 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 over again. House, house, house. That might build an house for the Lord and an house for his kingdom. And now... I have sent a cunning man endued with understanding of Hiram, my father's, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre, skillful to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in iron and stone and in timber and purple and blue and fine linen and crimson, also to grave any manner of graving and to find out every device which shall be put to him. It doesn't matter what it is. He's ready. Just like 2 Timothy 4, 2. Instant in season, out of season. The cunning men, he says, with the cunning men and with the cunning men of my Lord David, thy father. So it wasn't just one man that was cunning, skillful. All of them. All of them. Wow, I could just really get off onto us. All of them. There's another problem that we have within the church today. We have this mentality that the guy that stands up front, he's the guy. We pay him. 
We pay him to read the Bible. We pay him to study the Bible. We pay him to tell us what the truth is. We pay him to marry us and bury us. We pay him to tell us what we don't want to hear most of the time and then get mad at him because he tells us. And if he gets too out there, we'll fire him and hire somebody else that'll do it for him. Every man, every man. See, in God's house, I don't know how we got to the place. Have we forgotten in the book of Acts that the revival that took place after the ascension of Christ didn't start with the apostles. Those guys were wanting to stay in Jerusalem. It was a group of deacons that God used to send forth and to send out. And even then, they were reluctant, so he raised up a man named Saul. And once he got them stirred up, he changed him to Paul. And then they had a hard time keeping up with him. Verse 15, Now therefore the wheat and the barley and the oil and the wine which my Lord hath spoken of, let him send unto his servants. And we will cut wood out of Lebanon as much as thou shalt need, and we will bring it to thee in floats by sea to Joppa, to the Mediterranean Sea, and thou shalt carry it up to Jerusalem. And Solomon numbered the strangers that were in the land of Israel after the numbering wherewith David his father had numbered them, and they were found in hundred and fifty thousand and three thousand and six hundred. And he set three score and ten thousand of them to be bearers of burdens, and fourscore thousand to be hewers in the mountain, and three thousand and six hundred overseers to set the people a work. First, the request. Solomon sends to Hiram, hey, send me your best. I'm about to build. I've got supplies. I need some timber, but I need laborers. I need some people who know how to work and not just know how to work, they know how to do a job right. The reply comes back. Hiram says, absolutely. Your God is God. And I'll send them in. You send the stuff you promised, I'll send them in. The request, the reply, and now the reminder. I told you we'd get back to some things. Now the reminder. So what? Have you ever asked that in Bible study? So what? You need to. You need to. When you get through reading a passage of Scripture, you need to ask, so what? So what does this have to do with me? How does this apply to my life, to us? So turn with me back to verse 1. In this reminder, I want us to look at the determination of the builder. The determination of the builder. Verse 1 says, And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord. You can skip to verse, five, verse 4. He says, I build a house. Verse 5, I build. Verse 6, I should build. Verse 9, I am about to build. Determined to build. There's a king greater than Solomon. And he is determined to build as well. His name is Jesus Christ. And in Matthew 16, verse 18, he says, Upon this rock, I will build my church. Now we've got to keep in mind that this idea of the temple has three different applications to us in the New Testament. And so I just don't want to have you just believe me. So look at three verses with me real quick before we come back. The first one is found in John's Gospel, chapter 2. John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 21. 
we read this. But he, speaking of Jesus, spake of the temple of his body. He spake of the temple of his body. This is where Jesus says, tear down this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. So Jesus is using the idea of the temple as a symbol, a picture of his physical body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, we read this. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. One more verse. Same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 19 and 20. What? He says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. So the temple is used as a picture of Jesus' physical body. The temple is used as a picture, a symbol of our individual bodies. But that's not really our discussion tonight. In Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 20 says this, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the, prof and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So we have Christ, we have the Christian, and we have the church. I want us to focus on the church. Because... Jesus the King has determined, determined to build His church. When we first started Solomon's Porch, it started out as a uh, home Bible study. And there were some disgruntled people in our midst. And some of them weren't interested in being a part of another church. They had given up on the idea of church. And I sat there in the midst of that group of men and I said, you guys can do whatever you want to do. As for me, I don't care how often I am hurt. I don't care what happens. I don't care what anyone does, good or bad. I'm going to spend my life in God's church. That's what Jesus is about. That's what I'm going to be about. Tonight, we, we get all involved and excited about all kinds of things. But God's heartbeat is His church and what He's called it to do. That's what He's really interested in. And if that's what He's interested in, and I call myself his child. I call myself his disciple. That is what I should be interested in. So there's a determination of this builder. Zechariah prophesies, and he says this branch is going to come, this one called the branch. And he is going to build the temple. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews talks about Moses and the, and the house and, and then he goes on and refers to Christ building the house and he's greater than the house. And Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. He does it because of his love, just like Solomon, I mean, just like Hiram said. And Solomon says, this is a great house. And it's for a great God. And in Matthew 28, we're told of something that we call the Great Commission. It's still great. The work is just as great, greater. It's 
greater. On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's the church I want to be involved in. I want to be involved in a church that hell knows about. You know, the book of Acts tells us about the seven sons of Sceva. You know, they get this idea that they're going to cast some, some devils out. And they find this guy that was demon-possessed. And, and they said, we adjure you in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. And the demon said, Jesus, we know. Paul, we know. But who are you? I'm afraid tonight that a lot of what we call church, hell would say, who are you? Who are you? We, we, we hadn't heard much about you in these parts. You haven't really hindered much of what we're doing. I want to be a part of the church that hell knows about. Well, so we've discussed the determination of the builder. Let's look at the day laborers of the build. The two verses talk about it. It's actually a repeat of one another, verse 2 and verse 18. It's repeated. But let's look at verse 2. And, and as I was preparing this, Corson just kind of set my mind and heart on fire with an idea, and it just kept building. The first thing we see in verse 2 are those that bear burdens. The first group of people that are involved in building this house are those that bear burdens. Which I believe is a good picture of what we used to call in the church prayer warriors. Men and women who would seek God with real burdens, present those burdens before Him, and watch testimony after testimony after testimony. Watch God move and lift and do things that could not be done otherwise. In Galatians chapter 6, we're told, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, maybe, maybe, there's a couple reasons why we don't have as many prayer warriors in the church as we used to have. The first reason, I would say, is because it's hard work. It's hard work. Especially if we're struggling with being in the flesh. Because most of our prayers, and I must confess, a lot of my prayers is, Lord, bless us for, and no more. Amen. You know, if I get a migraine headache, I'll pray while you ain't never heard somebody pray. I get a belly ache, and I'm vomiting and running to the bat, I'll pray and pray and pray. If I have to have surgery, man, I'm praying. I'm fasting and praying. But if I hear Sister Spukenbacher gets a headache, I just go, well, poor thing. Hope she gets better. See, being a spiritual warrior, a prayer warrior, takes effort. It's hard work. And the king, remember, is looking for laborers. Looking for laborers. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray. Pray the Lord of the harvest. I got in trouble one time. I was in a group of pastors and they were, they were strategizing on how they were going to reach the community and do this and do that. And all these ideas were going around the little table and, and written down in the little notebooks and stuff. And, and I, I slipped up and said something that just set the whole room on edge. I said, here's an idea. Why don't we pray first? Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest. The meeting got canceled right then, and we went to lunch. Because see, praying is hard work. And here's the other reason I think that, that prayer warriors aren't what they used to be in the church, because prayer warrior stuff is done in a closet. Not in the corporate gathering. It's not something that's seen. They don't pass out trophies for it because nobody knows who they are, but God does. 
And I think when we get to heaven and the crowns start getting passed out, you know, we got these ideas that the big shots, the big wigs, the ones that are, you know, that are most prominent and dominant and seen out front. We think, wow, those guys and gals are going to shine on that day. But I think we're going to be shocked. Because I've read stories where like Billy Graham that we think, wow, and I used to think, I don't want to be behind him on, on that day, right? At the Bema seat, I don't want, I don't want to be behind Bill. <laughs> Why, Bill, Lord, Billy, come on. Hey, you, you, want, you want to cut? You want to cut? Nobody's going to want to cut and get in line. But I've heard stories of, of, of men and women who would be backstage during them crusades. And they were on their knees praying. And see, we're watching from the stadium. We're watching from the television. And we think, oh, Billy. And I'm not trying to take anything away from my brother. But heaven is saying, heaven is saying, oh, look at, look at that one. Look at her. Listen to her. Heaven's collecting those prayers. You know, they're going to get poured out during the tribulation. Hmm. I think we're going to be shocked. Burden bearers. The king is looking for laborers. Men and women who will get on their knees and pray and pray. We have the idea sometimes though when the, when the doctor walks in and says, maybe it's time to call the minister. Maybe you need to start praying. We tend to, we tend to think, oh no, has it come to that? It should have always been that. It's always been that. I read one time where a pastor was, was, was taking over a church and it was difficult. There'd been problems in the church and all this and there was just trouble and strife and, and he was having a, a business meeting and, oh, if you've ever been in those. Anyway, he, he was there in that, but he had found out that there was a group of men who had committed to pray for him and to pray for the church. And it just so happened that the night that they were meeting for their prayer meeting was the same night of the business meeting. And things were getting hectic and, and heated in this meeting. And the pastor was asked, so what direction are you going to go in? What are you going to do? And I guess partly in frustration, but in part, hopefully in the spirit, he says, I tell you the direction I'm going to go in. I'm going to go in the direction of what's happening in that room in the back, back there. That's the direction I'm going in. We need to get rid of a lot of our committees where we come up with ideas of things to do and we put it all together and then we decide, well, let's pray. We want to pray real quick and ask God to bless it. What we ought to do is get on our knees and seek the Lord, find out what He's doing because it's blessed already. And be a part of that. So first there was those that would bear burdens. Next there were those that would hew stone. Stone cutters. And it's interesting. Peter says in, in chapter 2. Ye are lively stones. We read in Ephesians 2 where we're fitted together. We're fitted together. So there are those in the church should, that should pray. Their calling is to be prayer warriors. There are those in the church, all of us, should be disciplers. We should be shaping the lives of one another. Well, see, that too is not that popular because that too is work. Because the first time you take that, that hammer to the quarry and smack old Sister Spookenbacher with it, She's liable to slap you back. But she's not trying to shape your life. It's work. This thing called discipleship takes effort. We got to get up in each other's business. We got we to gotta be accountable to one another. And folks don't like that. Everybody likes the Christian until the Christian tells them the truth. And they don't like them anymore. But I'm here tonight to tell you, if there's someone in your life that'll look you in the white of your eyes and tell you the truth, that is the best friend you've got this side of heaven. They're shaping. And yes, sometimes 
<laughs> oh, oh. Sometimes it hurts as God is chipping away what doesn't need to be there so that you can fit in the place that He has you in this temple that He is making a habitation for Him. That's what God's wanting to do. That's what discipleship is all about. And sometimes it's like, oh, off limits. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not off limits. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Jesus started the church by choosing 12 men to spend time together. We think discipleship is getting in a classroom. Jesus never used a classroom. Now, I'm not against classrooms, but he didn't use them. It was belly to belly, eyeball to eyeball, getting up in each other's business. It's dirty, it hurts. You get offended. It happens. It's called discipleship. It's what changes our lives because we got to see the big picture. This work is great because God is great and He's preparing me. He's preparing you to fit in a temple that brings glory and honor to Him. Okay, okay, okay before we move on. See, we're living in a day and a time in the church, especially among men, but I'm starting to see it happen among women in the church too. We want to be isolated. We just want to show up to church, go home. Show up, go home. Now I know there's a lot of different reasons why people leave and, 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 and that type of thing. Some people's got work or whatever. I, but I just know there's a lot of folks that... They're sitting in here at the opening prayer, but at the amen at the last prayer, they're gone. Or by the end of the last song, gone. Out of here. There's folks that don't like meet and greet. Wish we would just do away with that. There's folks that don't like worship. These are all those intimate parts of Christianity. See, worship is when I open up and I invite God in. And see, Jesus don't care about my boundaries. And I'm glad he don't. Because I've had him take stuff out of my life that if it would have been left there, it would have destroyed me. And we, we don't want people to get up in our boundaries either. So we don't want to... But if you'll do a quick little study through the scripture, men who were isolated acted insane. Look at Saul. Saul was cuckoo in a cave <laughs> thinking that a man named David was trying to take his throne. It's true. Elijah. Here's Elijah. Here's this man who slain 400 Baal prophets, called down fire from heaven, then left his servant to head off into the woods, the wilderness, because a woman was after him. And he moaned and belly ached in a cave, telling God he was the only one left. Jonah. Jonah did just about everything he did alone. And even after a great revival, for whatever reason, he didn't bring any of the people from the revival with him when he made his way out into the wilderness and sat underneath a little bitty tree and told God it would be better if he wasn't even alive. And God says to him, should I not care for these people? And he had the nerve to argue back with him. Insane. Samson. All of his relationships were messed up. God called him to lead a fight against the Philistines and not once did he ever team up with his fellow countrymen, argued with his parents. The only time he was ever with anybody, he was arguing with them, killing them, or having sex with them. That's the only time he was ever with somebody else. But we look at men like David, a man after God's own heart. He had a Jonathan. 
And he didn't just have a Jonathan. He had mighty men around him, men who would speak into his life and tell him, hey, man, you're getting off track. You look at Joshua, had a Caleb, and we could go on and on and on and on. Discipleship is not something that the church does. Discipleship is the church. Matthew 28. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples. Start shaping lives. And so, when we start looking at some of these these tasks that these day laborers would do in building the temple, it's not, it's not hard to see why we don't see the greatness and the skill and the quality that we once heard about within the church. Because the king is looking for laborers. Lastly, there were the overseers. Elders, pastors. Acts chapter 20 Paul talks to them. We know that Paul writes to Timothy and to Titus. 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter talks about these individuals who would be overseers. They would watch over God's flock. Not hirelings. Isn't it interesting that Jesus rebuked hirelings? I don't know what's gotten into me tonight. And that's what the church wants. He said, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. A hireling cares nothing for the sheep. When the going gets tough, the hireling's like, I'm out of here. But that's what the church wants. The church wants a hireling. Hmm. I better hurry up. I'm going to get in trouble. Lastly, the distribution of the benefits. We see this in verse 10, and we see it in verse 15. In verse 10... Solomon says, I will give to thy servants, those who are working, I'm going to give the hewers that cut timber 20,000 measures of beaten wheat and 20,000 measures of barley. Grain. Seed. That which makes bread. Sustenance. I believe is a picture of God. Jesus in the parable of the sower and the seed, he said the sower went forth to sow seed. In Matthew 6, he says we should pray, give us this day our daily bread. The prophet said in the last days there's going to be a famine for the word of God. Paul says that in the last days they're not, they're, they're not going to not gonna give heed to sound doctrine. They're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Tell me something good. Tell me how great I am and how wonderful I am. And so if the preacher says, you're a wretch, you're just a sorry sinner. Right, it's time to find another church, honey. <laughs> God's word. And I found it to be true. I have never yet been able to give out more than God has given me. I get in trouble because I try it every time I get up here. I try to teach the whole Bible somehow. <laughs> but that's what the king said. I'm going to give the laborers sustenance. And he does that. He is constantly sharing with me. He wakes me up in the morning speaking to me. I have dreams about it. I'm thinking about what he's telling me when I go to bed. I'm always hearing God, the Holy Spirit. Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. I'm in the process of recording videos for next year's men's study right now. He's giving me stuff for next year's Sunday school. Not because I'm great, but because he's great. Because he's saying, if you'll work for me, I'll just keep giving it. I'll just keep giving it. And some Christians are sitting in pews tonight and they're dry and there's a famine in their life because they've stopped sharing. They're just full 
Oh, you want to? Mm -mm, mm -mm. They come to service and they sit down and the preacher starts going and in about 20 minutes they look at the watch. Oh my goodness. Because oh, they're just bloated. Because for the last however many months of their life they've done very little with what they've been fed. They're not applying it. They're not acting on it. They're not bringing it into their life. They're not going home and talking about it with their spouse. They're not sharing it on the job. They're not talking about it with their prayer partner. They're not telling it to their children. Freely you've received. Freely give. In the parable of the talents, you remember it was Jesus who said, take the one talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. Boy, they'd get upset about that today, wouldn't they? All right, there's two more things. And he says, and 20,000 baths of wine. Wine. Wine in the Bible is a symbol, a picture of joy. Celebration. There's a lot of Christians who look like this in a church. Make me smile. They ain't happy with the pastor. They ain't happy with the people sitting on either side of them. They ain't happy with the people that rode in the car with them to church. And they ain't happy with themselves. They have no enthusiasm to do anything. The only thing that they're good at is to talk about everybody else that's there. Wine. Jesus turned water, every, every just ordinary water into wine. And the guy says, you saved the best until now. Nehemiah chapter uh, 8, I think it's verse 10. It's the joy of the Lord that's our strength. When we're doing what God's called us to do and we're doing it with all of our heart as unto the Lord, we're doing it as 1 Corinthians 10, to glorify God the Father. We're doing it like Colossians 3, in Jesus' name, with our whole heart. It's exciting. I love my job. I absolutely love my job. And you ought to love yours. If you don't love it, you need to either ask God to change your heart or ask God to put you in the place that He wants you to be. One of the two. Because He's called every one of us to, to work for His kingdom, to be a part of that process. Even the cartoon characters whistle when they work. So the least I could do as a Christian is worship while I do it. Well, lastly, he says, and 20,000 baths of oil. Oil in the scripture is always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Zechariah says, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be doing what I'm doing. I'm like Solomon. Who in the world? Who is able? Who is able to build a house? Who's able to do this? Jesus is able. Jesus is able. And by His Spirit, He will empower us to do whatever it is He's called us to do. It's a wonderful thing to have God's Spirit working on the inside of you enabling you to do and be what he wants you to do and be. You stay energized. You don't get burnt out. You might get down. You might get hurt, whatever. But God, by his spirit, and he's the comforter too. So he'll comfort you. He'll energize you. He'll enable you. Hmm. The king is looking for laborers. And you and I have an opportunity to be a part of something eternal that's greater than anything else we will ever be a part of in all of our lives. It's going to last forever. I don't know about you. I'm looking forward to some more wheat and barley, wine and oil. I'm looking forward to doing 
what He wants me to do. And I'm wanting to do it skillfully and cunningly to the best of my ability. Because eternity is a long time. A long time. And I want to meet countless people who walk up to me and say, thank you. Thank you. Because now I know as I am known and I realize it was your prayers that prayed for that missionary in Africa who took me into that orphanage and taught me about Jesus. And I got saved and grew up and had a family of my own. Or I got called in the mission field myself. Or I became a pastor. Who knows? Thank you. You filled up a little bitty shoebox with just some toys. Didn't think much of it. And went all the way to Madagascar. And I was so excited that day because I'd never had a present before. And I opened that box. But, it, but just in a few days, I realized that what was in that box was nothing compared to the greatest gift that had ever been given. And that was the gift of God's Son. And I'm here today because you were a laborer. That person that gets mad at you and walks away and don't want to talk to you because you told them the truth, you were so mean to them, when they finally come home, when they finally come home and they get to heaven and God shows them the big picture and He just plays it out. They're going to walk up to that discipler and they're going to say, thank you. Thank you. I got so mad at you when you told me that. I told myself you didn't love me. You didn't like me. You were just being mean. But thank you. Thank you for telling me what you told me. Because I remembered that in the pig pen. And I came to myself. And I came home. And part of the reason I'm here is because of you. This work, it is great. Our God, He is great. And it's because of His love that He's called us to do it. The question only remains, will we be the laborers He's looking for? Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much.